Okay, so when we talk about preparatory topics for the EMT, we're going to discuss the well-being of the EMT, medical information, um, and legal information that's pertinent to the EMT, as well as uh, the human body, baseline vital signs, and uh, lifting and moving patients. Now again, this is all going to be a, a very uh, brief review or overview of the the topics that we have listed here. So uh, if you need more in-depth material, obviously there'll be some uh, other modules that you can take or other courses you can take that will have more uh, extensive information on these particular topics. So let's go ahead and get started with an introduction. So with uh, emergency medical services systems, we have two different ways to access uh, the EMS system. Uh, first is through 911, and the second is through non-911. Now, what's non-911? Well, non-911 is any way to get a hold of the EMS system and activate it without calling 911. So this could be somebody calling the non-emergency dispatch line and uh, the dispatchers then dispatching out the uh, EMS or fire department providers to the scene to deal with an, an emergency. Um, this could also be, say, somebody who's out there, a uh, first responder um, of sorts, say like a, you know, an e, uh, police officer or you know, somebody else with a radio and a direct line communication to dispatch. Those are the kinds of people that might be able to access the 911 system using non-911. Uh, non so this is important for us to distinguish because when we use 911, um, there are just different tracking mechanisms uh, that are used. Uh, you'll go over a little bit of this if you're taking part of the communication uh, the communication part of the course. Um, if not, um, you know, basically the idea is that there are going to be, there's going to be a lot of information that's given when somebody does call 911. Mapping and routing usually automatically come up. Otherwise, it's just with caller ID, and a lot of times that's not necessarily sufficient, especially if you're in a more rural area. Um, so as far as levels of training are concerned right now, you know, if you don't already know, we're in a transition period for all the EMS providers. And so what we have kind of is a consortium of, you know, the things that the types of providers that are listed down here. We have first responders, we have EMT basics. Now it says EMT on the slide, but it's actually you know EMT basics and then EMT intermediates and EMT paramedics. Those are the old kind of you know titles to EMS providers that are going to be phased out, and uh, they're going to be replaced with different responder types or different EMS uh, different EMS provider types. Uh, now we have the first responder who's going to be going to the emergency medical responder role. We have the EMT basic who's going to be, uh, you know, switched over to the EMT role. And this is called the uh, emergency medical care technician here. And a lot, in a lot of states, they'll call it the EMCT. Uh, but in, in reality, it's the same thing as an EMT in a national scope of practice. Um, and then you have the EMT intermediate who is basically being changed um, into an advanced EMT. Changed is probably not the best word. It's more like transitioned if you take a transition course, which I'll discuss briefly here in a minute. And then you have the EMT paramedic who will be transitioning over to the paramedic. Now, what is the reason for all of this? Why is it that you know, we're, we're taking, um, you know, such drastic measures to change our titles after all of these years and provider types, after all these years of operating in the same manner. Well, a lot of it has to do with setting standards and trends um, na nationally and uh, increasing the standards of care 
and the increasing the standards of understanding for all of the providers so that they can deliver better quality care overall. The um, other the other idea uh, behind the uh, process is self-determinative. And, and what, what I mean by that is in the past EMTs and paramedics have have been kind of a an ancillary part of the medical community and really what uh, EMS providers are now trying to do is get a foothold on becoming their own professional uh, national organization. And this is so important because it will increase the validity of our providers and, and it, it will also increase uh, people's understanding of who we are, what we do, and, and the fact that you know we really are capable providers of, uh, and we can give excellent quality care. So that's kind of the big big overview of the reasons for the transitions. Um, and the other ones are also to you know get all of the states lined up into a more national scope of practice um, where you know everybody has kind of a similar care whether you're you know being treated in a rural area you know in the Midwest uh, versus you know being treated in you know Southern California or you know on the on the East Coast or in you know Arizona or wherever you're at you should be provided with the same type of care now states will debate about this and you know the feds will you know debate about it but the the uh, the gist of it is that these federal guidelines, um, national guidelines, are are kind of more being implemented into the state model. So, you know, now we're all going to be on the same um, level at some point in time. So that's kind of what the transition is all about. If you would like to read more about the transition, um, you can go to the National Registry's website, which is uh, www.nremt dot org again that's nremt dot org and you can read more information about what the transition means and when you got to get it done by again um, you know if you don't have the transition or you don't nationally have the transition within the required time there may be repercussions for not doing so um, it just really depends on your state certification and then it also depends on how everything's going to play out as far as uh, what the National Registry plans on doing so uh, definitely something to look into if you're not uh, if you haven't done it uh, it's recommended that you do it so that you avoid any uh, situations in the future with your certification in any event let's go ahead and move along with the presentation so in the EMS system, we have uh, the healthcare system, which includes the emergency departments. And emergency departments, of course, are so very important to us because they help for us to set the trends for emergency medical uh, care. And, uh, you know, they're the, they're the first line after uh, we get done with them in the field these uh, emergency departments will make a determination whether the person needs to be treated or whether they need long-term care or they need critical care for an extended period of time and what do I mean by critical care for an extended period of time I mean something like the intensive care unit um, you know those sorts of things do they need surgery so the emergency department kind of functions as a uh, as the as the hub of the uh, hospital system and it they will make the determinations as far as where the patient needs to go right after that. You also have uh, specialty facilities and what I mean by specialty facilities is usually these are facilities that are you know accredited in a specific discipline or they are uh, recognized for being able to deal with a certain type of emergency more than others um, and you should know who these are in your uh, neighborhood or in your city or whatever area that you work in. 
You know, you have the trauma centers. Uh, those are always good to know because whenever you have a trauma situation, you want to know where you're going to be sending your people. Uh, burn centers, same thing, same idea. Um, you know, where are they going to get the best care? And then the pediatric emergency centers, same thing. And then also uh, poison centers. Some places don't necessarily have poison centers um, or toxicological centers, but what they do have are, you know, areas that will give in give out information about, say, an issue that involves a poison emergency. Um, you know, poison control centers will do just that, and usually they're located inside hospitals. And then you have other specialties. So, and these are all locally dependent. So, what does that mean? I mean, we're talking about you know, say if you're you live on the coastline, uh, you know, and you have problems with, you know, underwater emergencies, and you know, say you have people that do diving, you know, what these specialty facilities will do is deal with, you know, the emergencies that that are locally, uh, that that occur locally on a frequent basis. Um, you know, maybe there's stingrays in the um, in the ocean and. And so they have to deal with any injections there, and what what would they do for treatment? Or you know, uh, say you're in you live in in Arizona, or you live in the desert somewhere. Um, you know, scorpions would be a, a good example of you know maybe a, what center, what hospital would take care of a a, a scorpion sting. You know, so th these are just things to think about, especially if you're um, encountering emergencies that are quite frequent. Then you also have um, hospital personnel, obviously inside the hospital. You know, it's which is going to be composed of doctors, nurses, and techs, and you know, laboratory people, and you know, maybe scribes who write down the information for the doctor, billing people. Um, so these are all kind. These are all people that you would want to make sure that you establish a good working relationship with. Usually, if they view you as an outsider, they're not going to trust your judgment. So that's why it's always important that you make sure that you present yourself well, and that you give them good information and uh, establish a good rapport with them. Uh, for your physicians, know who they are, and your uh, nurses also know. Uh, who the pre-hospital coordinators are, or the, the uh, whoever's in charge of the charge nurse of the emergency department. Those are important people for EMS people to know. Um, also, the uh, besides the hospital, you know, there's liaison with other public safety workers like law, local law enforcement or federal and state um, law enforcement. So these are also very important people to know. For your roles and responsibilities of the EMT, well, th what this is is, you know, we want to make sure that we're always safe on every scene. We don't want any of our providers to ever be injured or killed or, you know, anything to happen. So that's why it's always important to take all of the precautions that you need to take in order to be safe. And if that takes time, you know, that takes time. But it's very important for you to be safe out there. So what that means is when I'm talking about personal safety, you know, obviously we we always say body substance isolation precautions. So, you know, we put our gloves on or if we're going into a respiratory call where somebody could could have some sort of a uh, in a, a communicable disease, you know, then you're going to want to make sure that you're wearing a mask and N95 mask to protect yourself from any uh, fluids that might be airborne. You know, um, likewise, there's many other situations that might require you to put this personal protective equipment on so that you're safe. In addition to personal protective, protective equipment in a medical sense, we also want to think about personal protective equipment in other senses. You know, if you, if you're, you have a specialty, say you work on 
on an apparatus, a fire apparatus, you want to make sure that you're equipped well to handle the call that you're going into. If you're doing fire suppression activities, obviously you'll need to have your turnouts on and all the other equipment that you need in order to enter the building. And these are important safety precautions to take on every single call because it is vital and critical for you to protect yourself. And somewhere along the lines of that, there's an, there's an order of operations that you'll want to take into consideration when you're thinking about personal safety. This order of operations starts with yourself. You are very important. You are, in fact, the most important thing when it comes to safety. Because if you hurt yourself or you get injured or killed, you become a victim. And that means not only did you kill, hurt, or injure yourself, but you also became a victim and a burden on the system. You were sent there in order to make the scene safer, stabilize it, and manage it. And so getting, getting killed or, or getting injured doesn't help the situation. So that's why you are the most important person to look out for. Besides yourself, it's also important for you to look out for your partner or for all of the other people that you might be working with. Again, if you're on an apparatus, you may have several people that you're working with. So these are the people, your crew, that you're going to be taking into consideration and helping out. This is a priority, very, very important for you to make sure that they say they say safe as well. Also, it is very important for you to take into consideration the safety needs of your patient. If your patient is, you know, in a dangerous situation, get them out of that dangerous situation as soon as you possibly can, but also keeping in mind their own safety, the safety of the people that you're working with, and your safety. After you consider the patient, also consider other people that might be assisting in the scene management. There might be police officers out there. There may be other departments, other agencies that are working. Those other people you need to take into consideration as well and make sure that they're safe. Don't forget about bystanders. Bystanders can easily become injured, so it's very important for you to look out for their safety. And finally, potential bystanders. People that might not have necessarily entered the scene yet, but who may enter the scene at some point in the near future. You should take all precautions to ensure everybody's safety. Again, this is a, an approach where we're looking at everybody specifically. However, when you pull up on a scene, you need to make sure that you are looking at everything simultaneously. Patient care is based on your assessment findings when we're talking about scene safety. So what does that mean? I'm talking about if, say, somebody becomes injured as a result of crashing their vehicle into a power pole. This could be a problem for safety because of the electrical hazards that are associated with power lines. So we need to deal with that situation first. If you're not equipped to deal with those situations, you need to call somebody into the scene who can. In addition to dealing with these types of scenes, you also want to make sure that whatever you do, I apologize for that, uh, whatever you do, you want to make sure that you are also taking into consideration proper lifting techniques, uh, making sure that you're moving the patient safely. And, you know, this is important because the number one injury that occurs to EMS providers is back injuries over the years. Your back will eventually go out on you if you do not take safety precautions on each and every call that you do. 
it is absolutely vital, absolutely critical that you use proper lifting techniques, which we will go over. Additionally, as, as well as it being important to you, it's also important to make sure that you're keeping the patient safe by moving them safely. Properly secure them and move them. Do not take the patient and move them improperly and risk dropping them on the ground. Not a good situation. Make sure that you transport and transfer care and keep good documentation of the call that you go on. Patient advocacy is so important as an EMT. It is vital. You want to make sure that you are looking at the patient and advocating their rights. You are looking at the whole patient. The professional attributes of an EMT are that the EMT appears to be neat, clean, and projects a positive image. What this means is making sure that your uniform is washed and that you don't have food on it, or you don't have dirt on it or all over the place, and that you iron your shirts if they become wrinkled, and that you tuck your shirt in. Um, all of these things will help to proje uh, project a very positive image towards you when the patient sees you and when other people see, see you. Remember that you are not, you're basically a walking billboard. You reflect not only on yourself, but you reflect on the people that you work with directly and indirectly. You reflect on your entire department. So it's very important that you remain neat and clean. You should maintain up-to-date knowledge about your skills as well. So, hence the reason for taking continuing education courses such as this and refresh, refresher courses. Um, all of this is so very important to make sure that you are a good provider out there. And again, a lot of this information might be review, but the review is so very good for you because you don't want to forget all of the information or any of the information uh, you want to make sure that you know as much as possible when you're out there providing good quality patient care. You should put the needs of the patient as a priority without endangering yourself. We talked about this a little bit with, with the, uh, the whole scene safety scenario. Make sure that you are not risking a whole bunch to help your patient. It is absolutely vital, absolutely critical that you do not risk your own safety without being equipped or trained and trained to do so. You should maintain current knowledge of your local, state, and national issues that are affecting emergency medical services. Um, additionally, you should try to keep uh, good current knowledge of understanding what's going on in your particular department and whatever political forces may affect eventual changes within your department. Quality improvement is so vital and important to the EMS process. In fact, it's changed so much more recently because people are now starting to understand how important run reviews are and how important reviewing the processes are in order to improve programs. Learning from our mistakes so that we do not repeat them again. It's a one central tenet uh, it's one central tenet to the historian. It's also very important to EMS professionals to make sure that they are um, always improving the quality of their care by reviewing what they have done. I uh, pro apologize for that. I don't know why that keeps coming up. The role of the EMT in quality improvement. 
Uh, your documentation, again, like we talked about, you have run reviews and audits and then gathering feedback from patients and hospital staff. So this could be information that's included on a checkoff form um, that the patient might fill out, fill out say, a survey. Um, if your department does surveys, some departments do, um, where they ask the patients how they felt about the care that they got and specific information. You know, it's, it's, it's very important that this is not a punitive process. Quality improvement is vital to the success of an organization. And having a good understanding, a good working understanding of the fact that people do make mistakes is so important to uh, understanding a, a, how your quality improvement program can be more successful. It is not about pointing fingers or placing blame, but more about improving the system. So it's always a good idea to make sure that when you are running a quality improvement program that you almost have immunity for some of your providers when they make some types of mistakes. And again, there might be some things that occur that aren't necessarily um, you know, excusable during a quality improvement, but at least those those things should be clearly defined within your program so that um, if you do end up being involved in the quality improvement process, you're doing it the right way. Again, non-punitive is the best way to do, way to go if you want a successful EMT quality improvement program or EMS quality improvement program. Uh, also, you should be conducting preventative maintenance on, you know, your vehicles um, as, as well as uh, preventative maintenance and preparatory um, things, that, things that you should do to make sure that you're preparing for um, your situation where you might be going out on a call or um, preparing your equipment to make sure that it's working right, those sorts of things. Uh, you should also um, make sure that you're doing continuing education. Um, again, we talked about this before, but kind of in the role of quality improvement here, it's important to discuss because continuing education is a way that we can improve what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we can also improve by maintaining our skills and practice, practicing them as much as we possibly can. Um, additionally, um, not necessarily using patients as skills labs, um, but providing patients with the best possible care will ensure that your skills are maintained appropriately and adequately um, if you don't feel like where you're working at, you're able to get all of the information that you need to be successful or you're not able to do all the skills that you need to, to be successful um, or proficient in what you're doing, it's always recommended to contact your training officer um, or your local hospital or other departments to see if there's a, there are any ways where you can go in and get your skills done. I know a lot of times hospitals are very willing um, to uh, participate in bettering the EMTs in their community by allowing them to do their skills on their off time. Uh, medical direction, obviously very important, super critical. Uh, physicians are responsible for all of the patient care aspects in the system. So as far as you're concerned, you're going to want to know who your medical director is. Granted, you're an EMT, but it's very important for you to know all of the people that you're working with so that you can establish a good working relationship with them and they will be comfortable with the skills that you provide to the patients. Every ambulance service should have a uh, physician, medical director, um, many fire departments have medical directors, um, where, especially where they're employing EMTs, most of them, in fact, probably 
almost all of them do. Um, the medical director really is responsible for reviewing the quality improvement programming and uh, making sure that things are functioning properly. Obviously, it's the medical director's license, ultimately, that's on the line. If uh, something happens where uh, a provider makes a mistake, a medical director who's not closely supervi supervising might be held to be vicariously liable for the actions of the EMTs um, that perform negligent treatments. There's different kinds of medical direction. You have online medical direction and offline medical direction. Online medical direction is basically a system where you are asking direct directly um, from the medical director or the medical director's representative. Um, you can ask them by the telephone or you can ask them through the radio. Um, offline medical direction, you know, a lot of times we call these um, standard operating procedures or standing orders. Um, and you'll see the highlighted underlying text this is very important information for you to know. Uh, it's information that you'll need to know for um, the examination. So I'm going to read each of these bolded and underlined points. Um, even though it may seem redundant, it is very important for you to do successfully on your test. So that is why I will be reading it word for word. When provided with online medical direction, the EMT should repeat the order verbatim for clarity. If the order involves the administration of medication, the EMT should be sure to state the drug, dosage, and route of administration. The reason why you would like to, you need to be clear when you are doing this is so that they can't come back later and say, well, he didn't tell me the whole picture or she didn't tell me everything that I needed to know and therefore I gave them the order to do this and it was not properly done because there was nobody that was actually asking uh, correctly. This can become a liability for you. So it's always important to um, state the right information all of this needs to be stated. As far as offline medical direction is concerned, standing orders are accomplished per protocols and it is not necessary to contact medical direction for prior approval. This is a standing order. A standing order basically means that you can do this without contacting the medical director uh, for approval. Again, this is something that you should know as an EMT in your department what you can and cannot do. The EMT's relationship with the medical director. Well, you are designed, your role and responsibility as an EMT is to make sure that you are communicating with the medical director when necessary. But not only that, to remember that you are the agent of the physician. A lot of people like to uh, use the analogy that you are the physician's eyes, ears, and hands. Or you are the arm of the medical director. So you are essentially functioning as the medical director in the field. So that is why it is vital and important for you to make sure that the medical director has all of the information that they need when you are contacting them for online orders care that's rendered is considered an extension of the medical director's authority. Again, this might vary by state law. And the ways that it varies really depends upon how the state has it set up. In some states, you may have a system where you have a centralized medical director. That means that's a medical director that controls how all the protocols are going to work throughout the state. You may have a county medical director who's responsible for all of the agencies in a particular county or in a city. The medical director can be uh, utilized in a variety 
of in a variety of ways. Um, you can also have medical directors for particular agencies. Um, you can have medical directors that work for one hospital but service a whole bunch of different agencies. It really just depends on the setup um, and state law. You can even have medical direction f for one particular agency or medical direction for certain providers. It just really varies. If medical direction provides instructions that are certain to harm the patient, be sure to ask for clarification. Be sure to ask for, for clarification after explaining the situation in greater detail. Again, this is a common scenario where the provider can get themselves into a little bit of a pickle. So what do you do when you're asked to give an improper um, what do you do when you're, you're asked to give an improper treatment? You are supposed to ask for clarity. That is what the textbook says. If you know 100% for certain that the medical director is authorizing you or telling you to do something that would be harmful to the patient, you need to ask for clarification. There is some liability in this, so be careful. And that concludes all of the information for Lesson 1.1 the introductory topics for the preparatory topics of the EMT.